All right. Good morning and welcome to the live exchange. I am Dr. Pamela and today we are going to unpack this whole thing called um, systemic racism, institutional racism. What is going on? It is embedded in our society and um, we've had some politicians quite recently say that it doesn't exist. Oh, there's no such thing. Well, there is such a thing. And we are going to be looking at that today from a lot of different angles. I'm really excited today because we have two phenomenal guests who um, really, um, they have a lot to say about this stuff. And they dive into this, um, in whether it's through their research or the work they do or on their social media. Uh, there's just so much to look at. And so a lot of what we're going to be looking at today um, is probably not some of the same everyday things that you hear, um, but also looking at some of the aspects of how we're impacted in the workplace and, um, you know, hair, for example, I cannot wait to talk about hair, um, and looking at medical disparities, um, looking at some of the different barriers that exist as we are trying to, you know, proceed, you know, just live our lives, do what we do, just everyday things that we do and how we experience um, barriers and backlash to that. So, with all of the recent protests around the world, we can consider this a modern day civil rights movement. I actually prefer to call it a revolution. And it is our opportunity to take this revolution by the reins and just take off and run with it and, and, and really recreate you know, the world into what we want it to be. Um, now, that sounds very idealistic. It is not an easy task. It is step by step, and um, we're going to be talking about some of the ways that that can happen today. Um, so today we're going to be unpacking the history of how institutional racism has come to be, the modern day impact, and the effects of racism on even the brain. So, so much to talk about. Uh, so without further ado, I would love to bring on our first guest, um, Dr. Tolu Bamishigbin. She is an equity strategist and a workplace justice consultant based in Los Angeles. She holds a Juris Doctorate and a PhD. And within the past decade and a half, she has worked as an attorney in both the public and private sectors. She bought, she's taught both high school and college, conducted research um, on race, gender, class inequities, and how these inequities impact Black children's access to education. And before transitioning to the workplace, um, to workplace justice, which is what she um, currently does. She worked as an LA-based non worked at an LA-based nonprofit that does racial and economic justice research and advocacy across California. She's a mother, an activist, educator, and serves as founder and principal consultant at Magnitude and Bond Consulting. She also curates the Instagram account Fearless and Formidable. Welcome, Dr. Bamishi Bin. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you, Dr. Pamela? I'm good. It's so good to have you. <laughs> yeah, so I have been following you for, for quite some time. And um, and then it's funny because I often try to share your posts and my friends will be like, yeah, I can't see it. It's not visible to me. <laughs> and then I'm heartbroken. Like, no, this is so good. <laughs> I got to fix that. I got to fix that for you. <laughs> so um, I, I would just love to hear in your own words, you know, I gave your formal bio just now, um, but in your own words, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about the journey to where you are today? I don't think I've ever, you know, really heard, um, you know, you know, somebody who is an equity strategist and workplace justice consultant. And it just there's so much there. And I would love to hear, you know, your take on, on what how you got there and what that is. Sure. Um, okay. So thank you for asking. Um, and again, you know, thanks for having me on. I appreciate the invitation. Um, and so um, part of my background is uh, I was born and bred in Miami, Florida. Uh, I was born to two uh, immigrant parents. So I'm first gen. And, um, you know, one of the things that I would say about um, the difference between um, the way first gen folks grow up in the way folks who have been here for multiple generations is that we, we aren't socialized to understand racism, right? right. And so, um, because, because part of um, the journey to becoming American, right? Um, the way immigrants perform um, Americanism is, um, you know, part of the promise of being able to become American is to not only leave your culture behind, but also buy into the social hierarchy here in the United States, yeah. right? And so um, my parents never really explained racism to me. 
you know, because that's not their experience, right? right. Um, uh, Nigeria was colonized by the British, but it's still a majority black country. And so they came to the United States to study. Um, they had four kids and, you know, we just went to regular public schools, went to college, ended up going to law school. And um, my first job is when I really got to see racism um, up front, right? Um, and I would say it was a huge shocker for me because, you know, I had really believed, and again, I had been conditioned to believe that as long as I went to work, did what I had to do, don't give nobody an attitude, show up, work on time, et cetera, things mm-hmm. would be fine. And that's just not the reality of it, right? right. And so uh, for a couple of years, I had gone to different places and I just had never really found a place that was okay for me. And, um, you know, at, at initially my analysis of that was that well, maybe I'm weird or maybe I'm different, right? Uh, And that it was me. But in talking to other Black women, I started to understand that this is something that's really systemic, right? Um, It's an experience that many African-American women have. And it's not ironic that African-American women disproportionately are the ones who start their own businesses, right? It's not because, you know, we're the most entrepreneurial people on the planet, you know, even though that's part of the story, but um, it's because a lot of us get pushed out of traditional workspaces, Gosh. right? And so no, we- We uh, hear that enough, that that's but, yeah. happening behind the scenes. Absolutely, yeah. you know? And then like, anytime you hear, you know, that African-Americans are more likely to do this or more likely to do that, you always have to kind of unpack and try to figure out what's the impetus for that, right? What's what's the thing that's driving um, those particular trends? Right. And so, you know, just, you know, having worked in different um in different segments of the labor force, right? So I went through uh, the corporate America um, segment. I went through education. Uh, I worked in, um, for many years, at um, an elite public um, university, um, experienced it there. And then um, working at uh, a nonprofit, which is one of those places where we tend to feel like we're safe, right? Um, like for, for instance, you know, another reason why we see a trend of um, African Americans um, more in a nonprofit and in governmental um, in the government sector of uh, the workplace is because those are places that are safest for African Americans, right? There are certain protections there. I for us. Say, yeah. yeah, there are certain protections there that make it safer for us, but that doesn't mean that it's not toxic, you know. Um, it doesn't mean that um, we don't get um, abused and wounded in those places. And girl, I just got tired. Yeah, I got yeah. tired over it. And I was like, you know what? It's time to start my own thing. And so that's how I got to, you know, working on uh, workplace justice um, and um, equity work. Uh, one of the reasons why, um, and, and, and when you think about uh, the landscape around this work, it's usually embedded within that um, um, diversity and equity inclusion uh, right. umbrella, right? But um, one of the things that I found when I started looking into this work is that, you know, a lot of these companies will hire these women, whether they're white women, white men, or even black women to come into these spaces, but they really don't have any intention of changing anything. Okay. So that's one of the reasons why I was very intentional in choosing in choosing how I define my work, because I didn't want to fall into the trap of uh, being hired by those corporations that just give lip service to change when they really have no intention of changing. Well, and that's one of the reasons why what, you know, equity strategists and workplace justice consultants stands out so much to me, because it's not just the standard diversity and inclusion. Let's bring everybody in. Let's figure out how to include them. But it doesn't speak to the justice that needs to be (laughs) upheld in the workplace. And and so I I appreciate that so much because it it is it is a need. It, It forces people to face what's happening, whether it is sexual harassment, whether it is, you know, those small innuendos that, you know, people think really, you know, don't mean much, but they truly do. Um, Those are the reasons. And when you say that, that, you know, so many black women have started their own businesses, that is precisely why I started my own business, Um, you know, to, 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 to get away from 
the the toxicity of what mm-hmm. I've experienced. I did corporate world for six months in, of my entire <laughs> life career. Oh, yeah. <laughs> six months and I was out. I you know, and and I was living in California at the time, commuting from San Bernardino to Culver City. So that was a two hour commute for me. And I'm thinking I'm driving two hours for this. Oh, you know? yeah. So I, 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 I hopped on over to higher ed and discovered, oh, wow, it's a microcosm of the corporate world, you know? And so <laughs> it has its own unique culture. It has its own, you know, repertoire of tactics that they use to abuse black women and exclude black women. But, but yeah, absolutely. You know, and 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 I, I won't go there. I'll, I'll wait. I'll hold off because <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna put that on a because this is this would be a tangent for me, so I won't go there. Um, but but you know, I really I I think that there's a lot of value in what you're doing, and it was one of the reasons why I needed to talk to you and have you on the show because um, from the whole regulation of of hair to the you know medical disparities that we're seeing, you know, these are just this is just us living our lives. Yeah. We are just styling our hair. We are just trying to have babies, you know, and, and here we go. Here's, here's, you know, these elements of racism that are so embedded that people have even said, you know, well, you know, I'm sure that there's some biological reasons why black women are number one in, in maternal black maternal death. Um, so, so I'm saying all this to just lay the groundwork for some of the things that um, our listeners are going to be able to engage with um, today. Uh, we're going to take a break. And uh, when we come back, um, I'd like to uh, delve a little bit more deeply into some of this research um, uh, you know, about what's going on. And so stay with us, everyone. Um, if you have any comments you'd like to engage, definitely comment on, on our Facebook page. Uh, we'll answer your questions. We will acknowledge what you have to say. Uh, so stay with us and we'll be right back on the live exchange. All right. So trending. Um, well, we are in the middle of the National Democratic Convention. <laughs> um, and so that is, a, that's, you know what? I I was very excited um, with Barack Obama's Democratic Convention. And with this one, there's something about it that is touching me in a completely different way. And I don't, I don't even know how to ex- exactly explain it. And I guess it's because we've been dealing with so much negativity and despair over the last, I don't know, six months and well, four years, if we want to be, you know. <laughs> um, and so I don't know, it's just been refreshing to see the way that everybody is coming together. Um, mm-hmm. I should say everybody, but the way so many people are coming together, uh, mm-hmm. the storytelling is is compelling. That's always been a part of these, um, you know, political campaigns of storytelling, you have, you know, you know, somebody get on the stage and talk about how they lost somebody, you know, due to, you know, whatever the issue is. But there's something about this convention that has a different feel. And and even though the candidates that I, you know, really, really, really wanted aren't on the stage, but you know what, I'm like, you know what, we're going with this, we're going with this, we're going to make it happen. There's just something about this convention. I don't know if if you're noticing that, Dr. Michigan, but it's mm-hmm. just so different. You know, you mentioned the excitement that you had around Barack Obama's campaign, right? right. And I remember the, the excitement as well, right? But I have to be honest, I wasn't as politically engaged back then. And here's why. Um, I, I think... Um, a big chunk of what a lot of, you know, the more radical young folks, and I, and I really do put myself into that camp, right, of, of radical folks. I think part of the thing that sometimes um, they miss, and, 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 I, and, I, and I want to be careful in my word choice here, because I don't want to ever uh, suggest that they don't know what they're doing or they don't know what they're talking about, right? But I think um, sometimes you know, in our rage, right, which we have a a complete right to feel, um, we fail to see the bigger picture, right? And, you know, one of the things that I've um, come to learn over the years is that, you know, when we think about this path to freedom, we have to think of freedom and this this vehicle, this journey to freedom as like this multidimensional apparatus, right? Right. And that apparatus has to have all these different dimensions to it. So we have to have people on the ground in the streets, right? Um, we have to be able to litigate some of the issues that we see. So that's where like the kind of work that the ACLU 
comes in, right? Um, we have to have people within the um, political realm, right? And so around the time that Barack Obama was running for president, I was excited about him because I was excited about the symbolism of having a black president and, you know, the representation and, you know, really looking forward to seeing policies that were tailored for us. But I wasn't that politically engaged, you know, like electoral politics wasn't for me at the time. Right. We've right. gotten older, right? Becoming a mom, you know, as we get older, they say we tend to get uh, more conservative because the stakes are higher, right? right? We become parents, we buy homes, all those things. And we start thinking about all these different ways that these different systems impact us, right? Yeah. right. And so to speak to the storytelling, um, because I watched the DNC last night um, and, um, you know, Kamala Harris is, she's, she's, she's tough, right? She's tough. She is uh, eloquent. Um, she is um, brilliant. All of these things, right? And I think that, you know, whereas in general, you know, a good deal of the reason why we see the storytelling is, you know, so that we can humanize these candidates. Um, but um, I think we have come to know uh, Senator Harris in a certain kind of way, right? This tough cookie, the smart woman, the one who who drills um, folks who come into uh, these Senate hearings, right? right? So to be able to see her in the context of a mom, a stepmom, an aunt, a godmother, yeah. that was really um, important, I think, for Americans to see. I think also um, when we think about some of the dominant narratives we have around Black women, I think being able to help folks shape um to, to help shape people's understanding of who she is as a whole person, right. I think that was really, really important. And so, because, you know, a lot of times people just feel really disconnected from us as people because they think that we're different people. And we, you know, put our, how do they say, put our pants on one, uh, <laughs> one at a time like everybody else, right? Right. So, yeah. Well, you know, and it's interesting because I, I know just from following your page that there was a time where you were like, heck no to... Biden, you know, and, and, you know, and I know that that's, you know, now we're and there are some people. So here's, I think there's two camps. If we want to just kind of, there's some that's that, you know, who are like heck no to Biden. And I'm going to stay true to that. And I'm going to, you know, I don't care what anybody else says, whatever, you know, Trump, Biden, same thing. And then there's others um, like yourself, like myself, who have said, this is who we've got and we're going to make it work. So I would, I would love to hear you speak to that a little bit. Okay, so um, it definitely took me a moment to get to the space where I came to understand how important it was to go ahead and go with who the ticket is, right? Uh, there's a sister who also um, does uh, workplace justice work. Her name is um, uh, Ife. God, I can't think of her last name. But she had posted something the other day saying, this is the ticket. I know this is not who you wanted, but this is the ticket. Right. I know this, you know, you have your reservations, but this is the ticket. And mm -hmm. so that's my attitude right now, right? This is the ticket. Um, there was also something, uh, another post that I had come across. Um, I don't know if you got to see it, but it was the one where Angela Davis unpacks why the stakes are so high for this particular uh, election and also um, her approach to it, right? And so if Angela Davis is saying, He's about to vote for Biden. Who the heck am I to say that, you know, I'm too radical to vote for Biden, right? Right, right. So, you know, in that evolution, one of the things that I had to think about, because this is the thing that a lot of people um, don't really get, um, besides the uh, enormous number of deaths due to uh, Trump's malfeasance in office, so basically um, the way we got hit by coronavirus, um, a lot of the stuff that we've been experiencing since Trump's election have been things that we've been experiencing before Trump's election. And that's what a lot of people don't appreciate, right? That yeah. things have been bad for Black people forever, right? And so Trump, again, you know, besides the COVID-19, Trump hasn't really impacted us in um, a huge way. Uh, with the COVID-19, he's pretty much impacted the entire country, right? Um, us, you know, disproportionately, but, you know, et cetera. And so... Being able to step back and look at how other groups would benefit from a Biden ticket, right? And right. so one of the things that was huge for me 
huge for me is, and again, you know, as a first gen um, American, someone whose parents were immigrants, I think about the way migrants have been treated during this um during this uh, administration. And yeah. even though, you know, a lot of people will argue that um, even before uh, Trump got into office, you know, we saw um, huge numbers of deportations under Obama and et cetera, but the, the level of cruelty in this administration is just so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Repugnant for yeah. me. Yeah. That, you know, I'm voting for kids in cages, right? right? I'm voting for a lot of different issues. But that was the thing that really made me go, you know what? Biden is not my guy. Liz Warren was my guy. You know, Biden is not my guy. But, I was Liz Warren too. <laughs> yeah, but we have to get this guy out of office. And whatever it takes, you know, whether it's marching in the streets, whether it's electoral politics, et cetera, we have to do what we have to do and show up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I hope people hear that loud and clear because um, we, we have a lot of people who are who are dead set on, you know, she's not black. She's this. She's that. And um, more even more focused on her than she is on Biden, which is really, really, really interesting, you know. Um, so with that said, we still have much more to cover. So uh, we'll we're going on a break. We will be back. Uh, definitely uh, let us know if you have any questions, comments. We would love to hear what you have to say. Stay with us on the live exchange. In the interest of science, 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 science. All right, so the science today, the science is actually um, kind of basic. I mean, it's, it's basic to most of us who have been talking about institutional racism for a long time, but I think this is an important development in um, what happened um, in terms of definitions of how we are defining racism. So as of recently, Merriam-Webster Dictionary um, has revised its entry on racism after a recent college graduate in Missouri inspired by the protests and debates about what it means to be racist, urged its editors to make changes. I did not know this was a new thing. I didn't know that the Webster Dictionary is just catching up. So they have revised it to say that racism is not only prejudice against a certain race due to the color of a person's skin, as it states in um, the dictionary, it is both prejudice combined with social and institutional power. It is a system of advantage based on skin color. It makes me wonder, what did it say before? <laughs> Probably just prejudice and, uh, you know, the overt types of, you know, racism that people experience. But, you know, being able to embrace and admit and acknowledge that is systemic, right, that is baked into the way our society works, you know, People who benefit from it, you know, are not likely to define it as such. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Don't see it. Don't experience it. Just it's just, you know, yes. So I, I actually was quite surprised to learn that. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. So this is oh, and not, I a college student. She's a black woman. I'm sorry. Say that again. Oh, by the way, that college student, she's a black woman. She's a black woman. Well, I'm a, I, that's what I pictured in my mind. But I'm glad I say that. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and so and one of the things that I find one, you know, especially challenging when I am teaching racism in different courses that I have, um, it's is is that embracing of the power part of it, because, um, you know, a lot of people, like you said, they just they define it as you don't like somebody, you discriminate against somebody, you're prejudiced against somebody. Um, you know, we've seen the posts going around recently about what about Cannon? I don't know if you're familiar with that case where a, a child was shot um, in the head by a black man and the, the, the outcry from mm -hmm. some members of the white community was, where's all the protests? Where's all the rage about this, this little boy that got shot? Well, this is a perfect example of privilege and <laughs> um, some of the systemic um, underpinnings of, of our society. This this man who shot the the little boy was immediately arrested mm -hmm. and charged, and you know, and so that so that that is exactly the point is that we are still waiting for Breonna Taylor's murderers to be arrested, 
And that is why we're protesting. That is why we are raising hell because we are so tired of people sitting and, you know, and, and continuing their lives after somebody in the black community, the Latino community, the native American community has, has been brutally uh, senselessly murdered when, when it's not even questionable whether or not it's a murder. You know, look at how long it took for Ahmaud Arbery's killers to even be brought forth. That was only after social media was exposed to what happened. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, you know, the people who start hollering, you know, where's the outrage? And, the, you know, I think they um, willfully want to misunderstand, you know, the issue. Um, you know, first of all, cross-racial uh, violence is rare. Um, it doesn't happen at, you know, any large scale. But often when it does happen, disproportionately, um, when we talk about uh, police brutality, African-Americans and Latinx folks are people who are disproportionately victims of that, right? And so the fight is not just about, oh, you know, we were victims of violence, but it's also about holding someone accountable for it. That's the fight right there. And so the idea that these folks are like, well, you know, well, what about this dude? Well, what about him? You know, it's tragic what happened to this young boy, but his family received justice. Our families don't get the justice. That's where the fight is. Right. Exactly. Exactly. There, you know, it's interesting. Um, there's a post on your page, um, which I, I actually intended to have it up and, and ready, but I'm going to, so I'm going to try to paraphrase <laughs> what it says. You may remember the one that I'm referring to, uh, but it's the one that says, you know, all of this, um, you know, pushing for social justice and the protesting um, is really going to, you know, the, the idea is to dismantle society as we know it. Y'all ready for that? <laughs> I'm not ready for that. Can you please speak to that? Because that's huge. I mean, it's so, you know, we're protesting. We want change. We want change. But do we do we really know, you know, what this means? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that is a really big conversation to have. And I think that um, for folks who are on, you know, as they say, who wake up on the other side of capitalism every day, I know they're ready. I know they're ready for the revolution, right? right. Because right. they're the ones who have, um, uh, how would I put it? They're the ones who suffer daily, right? From this system that uh, these, you know, white men who came over from Europe have created, right? Um, but, you know, for the rest of us who, you know, get to uh, leverage our middle classness by, uh purchasing homes, uh, being able to work in somewhat uh, comfortable environment, right? We don't have to do the kind of backbreaking labor that uh, folks from previous generations have done. Some of us have gotten comfortable, right? And I think that there's a fear, and I think it's a a valid fear, that that uh, comfort uh, would lead to a certain level of complacency, that will cause even folks like us, right? Who, you know, we might not wake up on the other side of capitalism every day, but we do wake up on the other side of racism. Oh, yeah. uh, that will make us you know, a little bit hesitant to engage the revolution, right? And so I think there's a little bit of um, uh, class warfare embedded in that post right there, right? Like those of y'all who are comfortable, who have the nice things, who drive a Mercedes, who have a house, whose mm-hmm. kids are in the good schools, are y'all ready for the revolution? Sure. Because part of, you know, getting to the other side of this might mean that we have to give some stuff up, right? So right. are you ready to give your stuff up? Right. And what does that look like? I mean, and, and so for some people, you know, this whole idea of, of revolutionizing, um, you know, some of the things that we want probably are not even, we probably don't even have words for right now. They're probably not definable right now. And so we have to be willing to walk into that, abyss of not really knowing exactly what the other side of this will look like and mm-hmm. and not resist. And honestly, I think that this Biden Kamala, uh, it's funny, I give his first name, his last name, her first name. <laughs> I'm also familiar with her, but, but out of respect, this Biden Harris ticket, um, you know, it's, it, I think that this is reminiscent of that because- yeah. No, it's not Bernie Sanders. No, it's not, you know, the, you know, the revolutionary, you know, uh, um, Elizabeth Warren, who's going to do away with, you know, student loans and, and, you know, all of these radical ideas. No, it's not that. But yeah. there, but what it might look like is a, a Biden-Harris ticket that opens the door 
to, to so I mean, just we, we saw history last night when mm-hmm. Harris accepted the nomination. I got chills when I saw that moment um, mm-hmm. as the first, you know, African American, e- Asian American woman to to. This is huge, mm-hmm. and for me, that alone, opening that door alone takes us leaps and bounds ahead potentially of where we've been since the beginning of this country. I have to say you're a lot more optimistic than I am. <laughs> I'm not seeing it as an opening of a door. I am seeing it more as uh, giving us a reprieve to be able to come up with some air. That, because, that way too, yes. Yeah. yeah. This crazy I, administration. Yeah, yeah. And I do, I do see it as a reprieve. <sighs> Finally, please, please, you know, give us that reprieve. Uh, but when I see my daughter, you know, who gets to look at this and a generation that sees something different. Um, I see them stepping through that door. I see them running through that door. Um, yeah. If we usher this, if we usher them in the right way. So, uh, you know, so, so yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you for sure. We, we need the reprieve. Yeah. <laughs> with that said, we're going to give you all a reprieve and go on a break. And uh, when we come back, uh, we have uh, much more to talk about. So stay with us on The Light Exchange. All right, next, I'm Dr. Pamela, and I am joined by Dr. Bakuchin. We are talking about institutional systemic racism. Um, one of the things that um, I really wanted to make sure we got into before we left is um, an area that's actually um, near and dear to my heart. I, I'm, I'm actually working on or developing a research study um, around Black women in Canada. And really what what's happening with that, I'm looking at it from a relational standpoint in terms of how um, black women and their doctors engage and interact with each other. Um, here in the state of Georgia, we are listed as, as, the high, as having the highest um, rate of maternal black death. And it's interesting because when I've spoken to people about this, the first thing they go to is, well, you know, you've got these single poor black women having children and they're not taking care of themselves. And, and this really is not, you know, what, what's causing this. I would love to hear your, your take, uh, because I know that you've also taken this issue to task as well um, on social media. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, the idea that a white woman with a high school education or less has better birthing outcomes than a black woman with an advanced degree right. should already be a sign, right? Right that you know that there's something in the system, right? Something in the water that's impacting us differently. So it's not only um, our relationship with the healthcare system, but just the impact that racism has on our lives, right? Yeah. And so uh, the, the weathering of the body, which, which is what they call it, weathering is part of why we end up having these elevated uh, issues when it comes to maternal health, um, because you know it it, it uh, impacts our ability to have successful pregnancies, and then you add uh, access to adequate health care into the mix, right? And then you add um, bias by medical providers into the mix, and then you add all these other different factors, and so um, basically we're getting hit from multiple different directions. Right. And so um, for me personally, I have, um, I'm someone who's been impacted um, by this. Uh, I am um, a mother of one. Um, I've been pregnant three times and I only have one child, right? Um, I lost uh, twin baby girls uh, midway through uh, that pregnancy. Um, and a good deal of it, um, I would probably attribute to um a medical provider who wasn't really listening to yeah. me and my concern. Yeah. Even, you know, with my daughter, um, I ended up going into labor with her at uh, about 26 weeks or so. And, mm-hmm. you know, when I went in for my um, checkup at about 28 weeks. I had to beg the doctor to take a look, right, to do an ultrasound and make sure that she was okay in there because of, you know, my fibroids. And, you know, yeah. one of the things about fibroids is that, the same hormones which help the baby grow also grow the fibroids. And so I had to beg her. I was like, please, you know, would you look and make sure that everything's okay down there? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, if I hadn't insisted, I would have walked out of there. And so, um, you know, she said to me that it was a good thing that um, she checked. Um, she rolled me into labor and delivery. And she said that if you 
would have left this hospital today, you would have been having your baby on the kitchen floor. Oh my gosh. And, and I'm a woman with a law degree and a PhD. Okay. I have access, you know, I, and you know, that's the thing one of the best hospitals in the country. Right. And, and what we're seeing is that a lot of the, um, the black women who are experiencing this are, you know, they have access and, you know, one of the women here in Atlanta worked for the CDC. Um, and, and so she's fully aware of, of, you know, what's going on health wise, but, that's that is exactly what what I heard you say that um, they're not women are we're not being believed we're not being listened to um, that has directly resulted in bleeding out and yes. other causes of death that are completely avoidable. Oh God, you know, at the time I was only worried about the health of my daughter. It wasn't until my second pregnancy, which was also a high risk pregnancy, that um, it had finally dawned on me because my father had said something to me about it. I hadn't even been worrying about my own health. Mm. I was only trying to save my child. Right. right? right. My dad was like, are you thinking about how this is impacting you and how you could potentially die? And it really put things in perspective. Wow. For me. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a really precarious thing for black women. I'm trying to remember what the data says, but it says something along the lines of um, if pregnancy was a job, it would be the third most dangerous job. Wow. Yeah. My goodness. That, that, that I have not heard. Wow. And I, and I believe it. I, I fully believe it. Um, you know, and that's, you know, one of the things that I, that also, you know, just kind of really um, gets to me is just the idea of, you know, we're, we're not being listened to, but this idea of, um, not believed that we're in pain. So there's, there's been studies that looked at, you know, that doctors actually believe that we don't have as many nerve endings. I mean, so now we're trying to get into like false science, you know, we don't have as many nerve endings. Um, And and so therefore we can tolerate pain at a higher level. And, you know, and it's, it's just unbelievable, the level of, of, of bias, you know, um, know that it's precisely because of that reason that the, opioid epidemic didn't hit black communities because doctors already don't give us medication for pain, yeah. right? And so that's how those white communities were impacted because wow. doctors believe them when they talk about pain because doctors don't believe us when we talk about pain. They either under medicate us or they don't medicate us for our pain. So that's a huge reason why we didn't see the opioid epidemic in our community. That is so interesting. Well, we are, we're going to go into the second hour, but I want you to give an opportunity. I want to give you an opportunity to let people know how they can reach out to you and how they can contact you um, if, you, if you want them to. <laughs> um, so um, you can email me at magnitude and bomb consulting at gmail.com. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram where I, you know, post pretty regularly at a fearless and formidable um, on Instagram. Yes, that is a phenomenal page. I love it. I go to it every now and then just to check on you know, what's new today. Um, and every now and then I have I have used it on the show. I don't know if you know that, but I've always you know said so from this page. Great fun. So I, I appreciate all of your content and your your knowledge, your wisdom, your expertise. Um, so thank you. It's been my honor to have you on the show. Thank you for me, Dr. Pamela. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to go to break. And uh, when we come back, we're going to continue this conversation with the Carla Fullwood. We'll be back. Hi. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello and welcome to the second hour of the live exchange. I am Dr. Pamela and today we are looking at systemic racism and getting an idea of what does this look like? How does this play out? And what is it that we can do uh, to address it? So this hour we are going to have Carla Fullwood on who will help me uh, with the dialogue. And uh, first hour was phenomenal. With Dr. Tolu Bishi, um, oh gosh, I, I, I have, I'm mispronouncing her words, her name right now. Um, but yes, um, uh, we we had a phenomenal conversation in hour one, and I am ready um, for hour two as well. And um, so, are we are we ready to bring Carla on? If we are ready to bring Carla on, there you are. Hey, so hello, <laughs> hello, hello. Thank you so much for joining us. 
Thank so, you for having me, Pam. Absolutely. So um, I just would love to give you all a little bit about who Carla is. So Carla Fullwood is a dynamic higher education professional with about 15 years of experience in student development, diversity, equity, and inclusion and educate inclusion education and training. Her areas of expertise include designing and facilitating intergroup dialogues and professional development opportunities focused on social justice education, racial equity, and intercultural competence. Carla is a proud wife, daughter, sibling, educator, member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, and member of Hashtag the beehive. <laughs> Carla is currently a PhD candidate in the Educational Leadership and Cultural Foundations Program at UNC Greenbor Greensboro with research interests in Black women administrators in higher education, Black feminism and womanism, critical med media liter literacy, and race dialogues. Woo, you are a busy woman. Thank you so much <laughs> for joining us. So, I I'm so, oh, doing well, doing well. You know, we just had a, a really great conversation um, first hour and I'm um, just like really pumped to, to keep it going. No pressure, no pressure at all. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, you already know me, Dr. Cam, this will be a conversation. <laughs> right, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes. And so well, one of the things that I wanted to just kind of start off with, we finished in the last hour talking about Black maternal death. And really just um, how a lot of it is, you know, there's a lot of factors. And in some cases, it's due to not being listened to, not being believed when we're told that we're in pain, um, being disregarded in a lot of ways. Um, and we do have a comment from Facebook from Jamie Moronsi. And she's saying that, you know, it's insane that we have to beg doctors to do their job as um uh, Dr. Bimishik Ben last um, hour told us that she had to beg her doctor to give her an ultrasound that ended up being crucial, you know, to her daughter and her health. Um, Jamie also said, I remember putting myself on bed rest with my last child because the doctor wouldn't listen. He was born with fluid on his brain. And I wonder what would happen if I didn't listen to my body. Um, so I would love to hear your, your take on that. You know, what, from your standpoint, you know, is, is going on with Black women and their doctors and, and, and how does systemic racism even play in with that? Yeah, when I hear that, it really connects to what I'm really interested in researching around Black women and how Black women use and understand their voice. People don't want to listen to us. <laughs> People do not want to listen or understand or validate what Black women have to say, even if it is about validating or speaking on behalf of ourselves, advocating for ourselves. Right. It doesn't really matter until it starts benefiting the other person. And so I can see that happening in the medical world. I can see that women are fighting to be heard, to share like perhaps literal pain that they may be experiencing and not being heard, and not being regarded, not being considered. And that's something that's happening not only in the medical world, that's happening nationwide. I think we're seeing that now, um, a lot of what's happening in our politics, um, where our voice starts to matter when it starts benefiting another agenda. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, um, I, you know, one of the posts I saw this morning and I wish I had it in front of me because I, I want to cite who said it, but I can't remember exactly who said it. But what was said was um, after last night's um, Democratic convention and, and, you know, just the, like the all of the, the powerful voices of women that were that were amplified last night. Um, somebody tweeted um, this morning saying black women will save us all. So it was a white male. Um, and he said, black women are going to save us all. And he had a lot of back. And I'm sure he was well-meaning, but he got a lot of black backlash about that from black women saying that's not our job. And another black woman said, how much does it pay? I want to know how much it pays too. You know, I mean, <laughs> so I would love to hear you speak to that because on one hand, as black women, we say, Black girl magic, black girl magic. You know, we're powerful, we're magical. And then on the other hand, when a white man, and which I kind of already know, you know, the answer, but I want to hear what you have to say. When a white man says black women are going to save us all and the black women are like, really, excuse me, is that our job? Is that what we're here for? Are we being used for that? What What are your thoughts on, on the distinction between those two perspectives? Yeah, so it's double fold for me. There's a part of what he said that I would say there's some truth to it. 
there's, you know, I feel like I want to Google, I don't want to misquote any of our elder scholars, but I believe it's perhaps Angela Davis who kind of spoke to, if you free and liberate Black women, you free and liberate everyone. Right. And so if folks really recognize and understand that if you pay attention to the needs and the experiences and liberate Black women, you're actually going to benefit everyone and most, you know, most if not all marginalized communities. Right. And so perhaps there's a piece of what he's saying that's speaking to that where Black women will save us because if you start listening to us, if you start paying attention to what we're doing, there's something there. I think the other end of it is we're tired. <laughs> You're putting a lot of things on our backs yeah. without the recognition and without the attention and without the love and the respect. And so it's it's exhausting. And so run me my money. <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> so it's actual money. I show it's actual money or respect or agency or having positionality in politics and businesses and in education. You want us to save you. You want all the glory and the glitz, but you don't want to really put us on the pedestal that mm. is warranted with that. And so, yeah, you know, I can see folks saying, how much does that pay? Why do we always have to come and save you? Right. Oh, that's such a good point. All right. See, that was only the beginning of this conversation. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> You'll see where it's going to go. So stay with us. we got so much more to talk about. Um, we're definitely going to be talking about uh, WAP. And um, it's, it's so, <laughs> so, yeah, we got a lot to say about that, too. Uh, so stay with us. We will be back on the live exchange. All right. Welcome back the live exchange. I'm Dr. Pamela, and I am joined by Carla Fullwood, soon to be Dr. Fullwood. I'm sure her professors are like, nah, uh, 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 that's what she's done, but, you know, she's close enough for me. So, <laughs> so uh, we are talking about racism, and I want to call it that it's giving it a woman's fit, because I have to you know, like, you know, you know today, I, you know, and I often talk about Black men and what Black men have experienced. And, 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 you know, incarceration and some of the ways in which our Black men have been disproportionately treated. I've noticed that our conversation today from beginning to end has really looked at Black women's experiences. And I'm totally okay with that um, because we need a voice too. So we can talk about systemic racism and um, and it could still be all about us <laughs> today because, you know, there's enough to talk about to fill more than two hours um, when we talk about how we are impacted as Black women. So I know you're doing a lot of reading lately um, with regards to, you know, women's voice and systemic racism and so forth. Um, and there's a book that I wanted to just kind of highlight real quickly. It was, um, it's called Dismantling Racism um, um, by Joseph Barnt. And are you familiar with this one? No. Can I see it? Yeah, I don't have it with me. Um, but it is, it, it's, so the book is not intended to attack or to produce guilt because, you know, a lot of times, this is one of the reasons why people push back from conversations about racism, um, but its message is still tough and demanding. And so it begins by analyzing racism as it is today and the ways it's changed or not changed over the past few decades. Um, most importantly, the book focuses on the task of dismantling racism and how we can work to bring it to an end and build a racially just, multicultural, um, and multiracial society. Now, traditionally, churches are not strangers to the task of combating racism, um, but so much of what has been done is too little. Um, and we have yet to make a serious impact in the racism that surrounds us and was with us. And so this book calls us to begin our next assault on the evil of racism. And so the results that it seeks is freedom from all for all people in all races. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is because there's so many books right now that people are um, gravitating to because of the movement. Everybody right now is is looking at white fragil fragility. And that's like, white fragility. Like she like hit the jackpot. She wrote it, mm -hmm. movement comes, bam. Everybody's buying it. And so I just want people to know there's lots of books out there. Um, you know, there's another one. You told me to show you one. This is a good one too, the Racial Healing Handbook. Really great book. And that was written uh, to me here in Georgia, Annalise um, Singh. Um, she wrote that one. So there's so many. And I just want to know if, if you have one that you want to just kind of throw out there uh, for somebody who might be interested in digging deeper. Yeah, one of my uh, faves um, is written by uh, Daryl Wang Su. He's, a, uh, I believe, a psychologist out from Columbia. Um, it's called uh, Race, 
it's, it's, it's centered around like race dialogues, but the way he kind of like frames how to address and dismantle racism um, by nature of how we're not only finding ways to understand ourselves and understand others, um, requires us to be vulnerable enough to talk and to communicate and to ask those difficult questions. Um, so that's definitely one um, that I that comes to mind. Yeah. How do people go about, you know, kind of, because I had somebody ask me this yesterday. I want to do work in this area. I want to, you know, be an anti-race advocate, anti-race coach, anti-race, you know, um, but I don't know where to start. And I don't know if I am, you know, this, the whole imposter syndrome. I don't know if I'm equipped to do this. You know, how, how do people get started to truly be effective? Yeah. First thing that comes to mind is taking the time, do the work to understand yourself. Yeah. Right now, just as you said, right now, everyone wants to go into action mode and, you know, not not to squelch that. But then also folks are going into action mode without being informed and most importantly, without being informed about who they are. Right. How are you understanding yourself and your racial identities? And that goes for racially marginalized people as well as white folks. Mm -hmm. How are you understanding how you came to understand race, how you came to understand yourself how you're coming to understand power dynamics around race and racism and how you perhaps played into it or are trying to resist it, trying to understand what it looks like, what it means. I love how you said like racism continues to morph. We're trying to, to fight a demon that continues to ship shape, you know, and, and how do you do the work without really understand how you're coming to understanding yourself and how you're dealing with this now you know I feel like there's a lot of folks who are becoming woke and yeah want to go out and do but that may be recognizing that the work that you're doing may actually be causing more harm because you didn't really sit and recognize what you're bringing to the table or the harm that you may be bringing to the table based on your understanding or lack of understanding about yourself yeah yeah, that's that's important. Um, you know, it, it, what do you say? You know, because this whole idea of being woke, right? Um, what what is woke like in its it like in 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 its most I guess form of integrity, in the greatest form of integrity? What is being woke? Because we use it in so many different ways. There's fake woke, and I've seen a lot of fake woke going on. What does it truly mean? Like, yeah, in its greatest. You know, form. I think. I think for me, I would describe woke as being informed, as being critical, as recognizing sometimes where you need to take a nap in your wokeness. I think sometimes folks are super woke where they're sleepwalking right. and, you know, and, and, and forwarding and sharing things. That's why I love my work around critical media literacy. Like we see things and we are so ingrained in a high clickbait society. We're like looking at stuff and forwarding and not necessarily realizing who's putting what out and asking questions. Yeah. So we're so woke that sometimes we're, you know, I have a great colleague of mine who actually helped me with this language of like, you're sleepwalking woke. And so sometimes it is a matter of resting, going back, retreating, doing the self-work learning from others, being vulnerable and recognizing I don't have all the answers. In my wokeness, I don't know it all. We are yeah. unfinished. You know, Paulo Freire, who's known around his work with the pedagogy of oppressed, talked about this idea of unfinishedness. Sometimes yeah. people are woke and feel like I, I have all the answers. You can't teach me anything. I'm ready to go and do the work where it's like that worries me because sometimes yeah. You're so, you think that you know it all, which means you're not being open to learning from others and perhaps others who's going to share a perspective that you haven't even considered in your wokeness. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so big. That's so big. Um, and we see a lot of that going around, especially when you're talking about sharing posts that you maybe just half read and, and you really don't fully understand the scope of what's going on. Uh, so I, I definitely would love to, to delve a little bit more deeply into that, especially in light of um, Kamala's no nomination and, and the dialogue that's going around about that. And um, so we're going to talk more about this uh, when we come back. Um, and we are also going to dive into some research. So stay with us on the live exchange. All right. So let me bring you a little time. Um, so this study is um, really
like to kind of look at, and we, know, we included this a little bit in the last hour of the show, we talked about uh, you know, the psychological and physical effects to racism uh, that we endure, which, you know, as, as Dr. Demishikin had explained, that this in some ways also contributes to health issues that impact pregnancy and, and maternal health. Um, but this study says that um, it, it points to additional psychophysiological pathways that link to the facets of, um, oh, wait, 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 I'm looking at the wrong one. This one, this, that was, that was another one. Let me, let me pull the right one. Well, the, the other one is really talking about the ways in which our, um, um, our bodies are impacted by racism, um, by the ways in which our bodies are, um, you know, uh, physically, we, we experience um, trauma to our bodies, but then biologically speaking, we have different health issues. So, um, and actually this was the correct one, but it's the alternative pathways emphasize um, prenatal experiences. So how that impacts us um, before, during, and after pregnancy, um, emotional neuro circuits. So just even how we, um, in the brain, how the brain is impacted, the ways in which um, we respond to racism that causes fight or flight responses neurologically. Um, um, mind, you know, mindset thinking, um, and then negative um, affective state stemming from racial cognitive schemata. So just the things that we think um, affect us socially. You know, a lot of times people stop at the social impacts of racism, but they don't really get into the disparities that are caused by health issues, that are caused by cognitive, um, I'm, I'm sorry, neurological um, impacts, how that affects our brain. There's plenty of research out there um, that talks about, um, you know, even just sort of the DNA um, that's passed on um, for people who've experienced oppression and what that does to us, um, you know, biologically. And what I also found is quite interesting is that the DNA is also passed on for, for by the oppressors. So they have a certain strand of DNA that's going on down their family lines as well. And so if you've got that going on at the same time that you've got the impact of those of us who have, you know, sort of been the, the, the targets of racism, it's just, it's no wonder our society is a complete mess. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, it's not, it goes so much deeper than just the, um, the, the social um, benefits that we're not getting as a result of racism. Oh, for sure. Yeah. If, if you don't mind me adding, I want to uh, cite another Black woman scholar, Dr. Joy DeGru, talks yes. about this. Um, and, you know, really talks about the generational trauma that comes, you know, from post-slavery, from slavery, and how we're seeing manifestations of how we interact within Black communities or with other communities based from that time. Right. And so I remember being in a training once again, you mentioned I work in higher education, and I remember being in a training to be a support and advocate for students on our campus who may experience uh, sexual assault. And in this training, they talked about, you know, a study where they um, uh, introduced, you know, it was something like cherries or whatever to like a mouse or, you know, mice. And then um, and introduced it in a way that was like so averse and, you know, it was almost like traumatic to the mouse. And then they bred that mouse and found like two generations after the, the, the mice, you know, that came to, you know, two generations from that initial mouse had this adverse reaction to the cherries wow. without, without ever being exposed to it. Oh my God. And so I was sitting there, I remember thinking, and again, I work in education, more, you know, like many institutions who are moving in the direction of racial equity. Um, I remember thinking, so we could buy this and 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 see this as the research. It's a legitimate research. Understand it for this context. Mm -hmm. and not see the same connection to racial trauma. <laughs> <laughs> it's my like, like, like why? Why yeah. wouldn't it? And knowing that, you know, uh, it's you know, in slavery ending, 
was, you know, may, maybe like three, maybe four generations ago, not really long, right? And then if you think about the civil rights movement, not not far. Not, these are not things that happened millennia ago. These are things that people are still experiencing through that generational pass down. And why do we not recognize that? Yeah, if, you know, when you have the privilege not to recognize that, and you know, then then why why do so? So it's and this is one of the things, what reason why things like this are put on our shoulders to you know to kind of figure out because when you're privileged to not have to think about it, it you know, it gets pushed by the wayside. So thank God for um, you know for our scholars, you know, for for those of us out there who are looking into this. Um, one of the things that I uh, you, you you mentioned, you know, when slavery ended and it just kind of hit me when you said that I thought, you know, slavery ended, but trauma did not. Institutionalized yeah. Yeah, chattel yeah. slavery, almost right. how you mentioned racism shift, chattel mm -hmm. slavery ended. Right. <laughs> but and the trauma ways in which folks are enslaved may not have ended when Absolutely. you think about the prison pipeline and what have you. I mean, immediately after slavery ended, it was, you know the informal, uh, you know, forms of Jim Crow. And then of course they became formalized. And when I say informal forms of Jim Crow, I'm talking, you know, some, some serious, um, you know, trauma that was, that was placed upon us. And then, and then we had these uh, massacres that occurred all over the country um, when black communities did find a way to make it work in this society. Um, it was, it completely destroyed. And so it strikes me that, you know, when people say, you know, and I know this isn't what you're saying at all, but when people say, oh, slavery ended a long time ago, why, why aren't you guys, you know, why are you still focused on that? And it's like, are you kidding me? You know, if, if we look at the progression of what's happened over the years, the tra when has the trauma ended? We, we are just dealing with this summer, you know, the reality of black men, black women are still being killed um, by the people that are in power, by police, by, you know, and, and and it's being disregarded. You know, we have a president who, you know, completely turned his back on the entire issue and the fact that, that any of this has happened and has, in a sense, demonized the people who are trying to speak out against it. And so yeah. the trauma, it, 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 it continues. Yeah. It, and, and and I want to bring up this, this idea of institutionalized racism. I love how you brought up, you know, we're seeing it happen. We see we saw it this summer while recognizing this is just one summer out of many <laughs> of black and brown and indigenous folks being, you know, f you know, experiencing physical violence by nature of perhaps law enforcement or what have you. But I love how you bring up and being an educator and being in education, you know, I love, I love my work. I love working in higher education. It comes with sometimes headaches and turmoils, but I love being on a college campus. And I, I remember thinking there's a lot of in other institutions. So we can, we can say, oh, it's happening in a criminal justice system. It's happening right. in the police. They're doing this yeah. without recognizing that institutional racism is very much alive in other, oh. you know, systems, in education, right. in corporate world, in business, in medicine. And so being a higher, in, uh, a higher education professional, you know, lots of schools like businesses, you know, made all these great statements against uh, racism and supporting Black Lives Matter over the summer and recognizing, you know, this is what's happening. We don't stand for this. Right. And yet we don't name, while it may not be physical violence, we don't name the institutional violence that black and brown students, faculty and staff experience on college campuses. When black faculty experience, you know, a form of like academic violence and always being questioned about their research and always being questioned about, you know, is their scholarship legitimized and always having to prove themselves way more than their white counterparts. Staff Staff and administrators and students experiencing a form of trauma in their everyday ongoings. I remember working on a college campus, and you know, you're familiar with this, Dr. Pam, where students 
navigating college campuses have to wear backpacks and always be conscious in wearing university t-shirts to not be, to hopefully not be stopped by police and or other faculty and staff about right. do you, are you a student here? Do you go here? Like we yeah. don't recognize this is not just happening in random, you know, neighborhoods and police. It's, it's happening in other institutions. It just looks different. It's not somebody having a knee pressed on their neck physically, but there's like the metaphorically pressures and the metaphorical violence that's happening and how I have to justify my existence yeah. in you know, the school. And like you even said with the medical, how black women have to justify their needs yeah. to get their needs met and to not die. Well, and to your point about, you know, it's not a knee in the neck. Um, there's a term that you and I have discussed before called spirit murdering. And that's that's exactly what it is. It's that idea that, um, yeah, you don't have your knee on my neck in a in a physical sense. It's certainly on my neck in a metaphorical sense. And, and you know, what spirit murdering is, is this idea that I am, and you, 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 you're killing somebody's dreams or their desire to, um, you know, move up or, or you know, join the, the progression of whatever industry, field, educational experience you're having. Um, Dr. Bimishik Ben and I last hour talked about the idea of, you know, being in the corporate world and what that was like. And I said, I was in the corporate world for a grand total of six months uh, because it just, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> um, and so, yes, these things do happen. And I was going to ask you, you know, what does it look like? And you articulated that beautifully, exactly what it looks like um, in, a, in a higher education you know, setting. And so you're absolutely right. We experience it in, in all kinds of different sectors. Um, so with that said, uh, we're going to go ahead and take another break. Definitely reach out, comment, um, ask questions. We want to engage with you. We would love to know uh, some of your experiences and your point of view. Uh, we are on Facebook Live on the Sensation Station Network uh, Facebook page. Uh, so join the conversation. We will be back. <laughs> Is it okay if I bop on live radio? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So welcome back to Live Exchange. We're talking about systemic racism. Uh, but we had to segue a little bit and um, talk about, because Cardi B has made a couple of appearance, appearances recently. And so we <laughs> first was this, this, this lovely artistic video. Um, and I can only give the acronym on the show, WAP. Also known as WAP, you know, like, you know, so y'all gonna have to look it up. Um, um, Mom, you gonna have to look it up. You have to look it up. <laughs> but she also spoke with uh, um, uh, Joe Biden um, earlier this week, and I want to share a clip from that interview. And I have free Medicare because look, look, look what's happening right now. You see why we should have been having free Medicare for a long time. I think it's I, of needed. course, Are we think able that to hear we it? need a uh, free college education. That's second. And I want black people to stop getting killed and no justice for it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I just want more stricter laws that is fair to black citizens. And, you know, it's fair for cops too. If you kill somebody that is that doesn't have a weapon on them, you go to jail. You know what? If I kill somebody, I got to go to jail. You got to go to jail too. All right. Okay. All right. We're back. So, uh, you know, I, I, I heard part of it, but I kind of, um, so, so I'm going to rely on you a little bit on this one, Carla, because uh, I wasn't able to hear the whole thing, but um, it, it's, it's that idea. I, I did hear the part about, you know, and of course I've listened to it earlier, but I go to jail. You got to go to jail too. Like, you know, where's the, you know, what's the stance here? But, but it's interesting. She's speaking out on these things. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Listen, I'm a Beehive member. I love Beyonce, but Cardi B has been rising as another one, you know, of I'm, I'm, I'm a fan um, for many different reasons. You know, I think the way she is unapologetic in being who she is while still being very pointed in addressing some really relevant contemporary social issues. And she knows what she's talking about. Yeah. And so, you know, I feel like what she was saying was looking at what's happening right now and talking to the Democratic uh, presidential nominee, Joe Biden, looking at what's happening right now, here's 
here's some of the issues I want to see addressed. And she's talking about racial inequity. Um, she, she names it equality. I personally will give language to it as equity because even in how she's saying, hey, if I kill somebody, I'm going to go to jail. These officers who are killing folks, um, they should go to jail too. At the very least, be charged. Right, <laughs> Come right. in, at least be charged, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and seeing that there's in in an in, in, in an equitable inequitable approach to systems, and more so than not, is perhaps not only because they're officers, but I'm going to say their race and gender plays a, a role in that. And she's addressing that that's a that's a need. That is what Black Lives Matter. Black people are calling for right now. Right. Address it. Yeah. Give us the justice, you know, that we deserve. Because Sometimes. if the shoe is on the other foot, as we see in past history, and again, looking at like the history of racism, we would automatically go to jail before even being charged. Right. Before even getting, you know, uh, 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 of, of in front of a judge to kind of figure out if we have like a formal charge or 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 um, not even a conviction. Uh, uh, conviction. I'm forgetting the word. Yeah. Do the same across the board. Right. Right. And that would be so. The, the whole do the same across the board. That's that's kind of what we would consider um, equality. Right. Um, it, it. What would be an example of equity? You know, I think for me. Equity would be in the case of black and brown people when they get, you know, charged on things, you know, do we get charged at the same, well, you know, do we get charged at the same rate or do white counterparts get charged at the same rate mm -hmm. um, for the same things right. that we would? So we are still seeing, it's like a hundred and plus days, Brianna Taylor's officers haven't even brought, been brought in front of anybody. That's right. inequity. Whereas right. there was a recent incident, and this is where I don't have all of my facts, but I believe there was a recent incident where a black officer, I believe, you know, was found to um, to kill somebody, and it's it it doesn't it doesn't move fast enough to sometimes get black or brown officers charged mm -hmm. and convicted. That's yeah. an inequitable element. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then when you consider, um, you, you know, perhaps the types of lawyers that, that black people or people of color may have access to and have representing them um, within a system of racism versus the lawyers and the teams that, you know, other people may have, it's, it's, you know, that's something that is going to impact the outcome, you know, of their For trial sure. as well. And so there's, there's, there's a lot of factors with that. Um, one sure. of the things that I wanted to address, because you are, you know, you do a lot of work on, on women's voice, black women's voice in particular. And I wanted you to speak to that voice of Cardi B, that voice, we'll put it, well, let's throw Beyonce in here too. Um, because a lot of people like to discredit them as entertainers, as women who might not be, you know, scholars with PhD. Um, can, can you speak to the value of their voices in this larger yeah. conversation? So black women, while we may have common experiences and perhaps, uh, you know, face some of the common challenges, we are not all the same. And I love how you even bring, bring up that there's usually an acceptable voice or an acceptable way in which issues are presented that will allow for folks to receive it and hear it. Right. Well, guess what? Not everybody presents, communicates in that traditional, acceptable, and when I say acceptable, informed by white supremacy, white patriarchy way. Right. Right. But that doesn't mean that I don't have something to say. That doesn't mean what I have to say is not well-informed. Um, and that doesn't mean what I have to say is not just as impactful and can contribute to uh, institutional change. And that's why I love Cardi B in that video clip, long nails and all, with her uh, and all, <laughs> will bring up very yeah. legitimate points. And, uh, you know, let's bring up Beyonce, how folks say like, oh, she doesn't speak well. She has that Southern drawl. She doesn't sound articulate. Now, when we start doing that, and, you know, I, I love, I love 
my identity. I love me, my black people, but sometimes black people be the ones saying the same things. Mm -hmm. They don't sound a certain way. They don't sound, they don't speak standard American English, but that does not mean that what they are saying is not just as legitimate. Right. What needs to be heard, and you know, don't sleep on Carly. She talks a uh, Cardi. She talks a bit about she experienced. You know, she she experienced a college education. She okay. she loved history. She loved uh, so, uh, um, uh, social studies. She knows political history. Yeah. She's informed, but she does not perhaps speak in this proper way in which the academy or newscasters or corporate America, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. seems to want to hear. And exactly. that's the piece that I want to push back on. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate that she doesn't speak that way because I, I love the diversity of voice um, that, that exists out there. We want social justice and diversity with regards to skin color, but we can't appreciate diversity um, with regards to how we express ourselves and our, our voice. Now I have to ask a question and uh, we're getting close to the end, but I can't not address this. Um, how, you know, she, so she just put this video out um, and it's very, um, expressive. It's, you know, of, of their sexual, sexual. I like that word. <laughs> Very expressive. Um, and, and for those who are about pushing forward the agenda for women and the way women are perceived and the way women are dignified in the, in the public, there's been so much dialogue going around about how demeaning this is, particularly I've been hearing a lot of this from black men. Um, can you speak to the, you know, to that and, and how what Cardi B's video and, and Megan the Stallion's video either contributed to or has taken away to advancement in, in our, you know, the way we want to be perceived as women? Yeah. You know, to me, it's, I find the video empowering because it symbolizes a couple of things for me that women you know, Cardi B identifying, I don't know, she identifies, I would identify her as Afro Latina, Meg the Stallion. Women being empowered enough to know and understand their needs and to be unapologetic and communicating that. And in this particular area, sexually, yeah. we accept it when we hear, you know, black male R&B and or hip hop artists speak certain things, or we don't push back in the same ways. Why to push back in this forum? Right. And I would actually say it's connected to a form of institutional racism, kind of stemming back from slavery and some of the controlling images that inform how black women perhaps sometimes see themselves and or are seen by, you know, by others with, right. you know, one of the images, the idea of the Jezebel. That was something that was controlled, that if you were too promiscuous, if you were if you were too in tune it as being a sexual being, we are human beings. Yeah. That uh, you know, folks have a range of in how they're experiencing their sexuality, but as human beings, there's some that is that's fine, that very empowering. Why hate on that? Yeah. And the fact that they are expressing that they should have every right to, you know. Right. Now, do they speak for everybody? No, but I don't think they can claim to say that they're speaking for everyone. Right. But we often we've you know, when I say we most folks and even you know I would stretch to say most you know if some black women have been taught to you don't talk about these things you don't say this these things right. it's too taboo it's too promiscuous you don't want to be perceived as fast or yeah. as a hoe or as certain things if you're talking about you know or if you want to express you know certain certain needs you don't say that you just you sometimes you just accept it and I think it's revolutionary. I loved how you even said earlier, this movement, I think you said it with the first panel, the first guest, this is a revolutionary moment. And part of that includes sexual identity, gender identity, politics. And if, you know, that's something to consider. Um, I, I love it. I love WAP. I love the video. You know, I think that it's something, it may not be for everybody and that's okay because there is a range in how people experience sex and sexuality but if that is what they are with their full choice and consent you know the, all those things need to go into it why why hate and why hate on it and not bring and not call to task some you know some other artists um in, in some of the same ways particular you know male artists 
Right. And Cardi B said, look, I put other songs out that, that are much cleaner. If you know, if we want to consider that dirty, uh, but that, that are, that are much cleaner that, that talk about other real life issues and y'all weren't writing for that song. I don't, I don't think that's nope. on the internet. So, uh, so, but this is the one you want to give attention to. So maybe y'all want to blame yourselves. And uh, you know what? Um, I, I, I think that's pretty well said. Um, so I, you know, I have so much more that could be said about this because you're absolutely right. You hit it on the head that that this is a way of expressing. Um, this is who I am. This is a desire. This is a need. This is the way I do things. And um, it, you know, and we. We, I think that people respond the way that they do because it's, it, it's, they're afraid. It scares them. Yeah. You know, yeah. what, what if I dared to think the same way? What if I dared to, to do the same thing? Um, what would I be seen as? Um, so, yeah. It, yeah. So <laughs> I'm looking at the time like, oh, we have to that up. No. <laughs> but I do want to acknowledge so a much to say. I know, I know. And I want to acknowledge a comment from Dwayne just uh J Dwayne Johnson really quickly. And it says it maybe it sounds strange, but the good part about being in a pandemic lockdown is that we're all home when we saw what happened in Mr. Floyd. And it's uh and still with this exposure to this, the systemic genie only came halfway out of the bottle. Hmm. There needs to be an admittance of this form of our political leaders on high for this to begin to end. So um, well said, um, Dwayne Johnson. So I want to go ahead and just um, wrap it up, give you an opportunity to let uh, people know how to reach you if you want to be reached, um, where they can yeah. find social media. Yeah, so I'm... I'm just starting to get some of my personal consulting and business up and off the ground. So the best way to contact me um, is real dope coach at gmail.com in front of, in terms of email. Um, I'm starting to build social media content and website. So look out, but for now, Gmail um, is the best way real R E A L dope D O P E coach c-o-a-c-h all one word yes i love it i love it well thank you so much for joining us and i appreciate you all joining us for this really important conversation and i hope that this is um if if, it's, if this is new to you let this is a starting point to continue it for those of you who are very familiar with this um please continue with these conversations they're so important um next week we are going to dive 100 percent into black maternal death so we're going to be able to continue that conversation we started today, um, next week. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is the live exchange. I'm Dr. Pamela. And remember, we are here to right the wrongs, to speak the truth, to rise above and to stand for change. We'll see you next week.